la donna è nobile, qual piuma il vento, lunga da cielo, e di pensiero. My name is Rolando Villason. I am an opera singer and I am a tenor. Being a tenor can provide the ultimate in job satisfaction. You get to sing some of the most beautiful music ever written in the world's greatest opera houses. Some people see the tenor's voice as the most captivating and demanding, but believe me, it takes dedication and a lot of hard work. This is the empty stage of the Royal Opera House Covent Garden. Huge, isn't it? Walking onto it with the lights shining on you, knowing that you have to give absolutely your best, is a daunting prospect. Most of the greatest tenors in history have performed here. They have all received deafening applause from the audience out there. <laughs> The tenor voice can move audiences and fill opera houses. And the great ones have become global superstars, way beyond the confines of the theater. In this program, I want to explore the phenomenon of the tenor in all its facets. I'll be looking back at some of the legendary voices of the past, as well as at some of the amazing singers performing today. From Caruso, Wunderlich and Pavarotti, to Domingo, Flores and Kaufman. But what is it that made them stand out from ordinary singers? What is it that gave these extraordinary tenors that star quality? Let's start with the basics. At the two extremes of the singing voice, we have the bass down there and then up we have the soprano this is the highest note of the soprano this is the lowest note of the bass in between we have baritones altos and tenors so what is the range of the tenor here i go starting with that c oh. And that was the famous high C. In order to sing those high notes, the tenor needs to be in total control of his instrument. The high C, for most of us, is our highest note. The image of any tenor is more often than not associated with the quality of his high notes. For better or for worse, it's almost like a measure of his greatness. The tenor has to come and deliver the good top high note, then everybody is going crazy. Our high notes, if they're bad, are possibly screechy and possibly um, unattractive, but a tenor's high notes, if they're bad, are usually cracking or non-existent. I mean, the pressure you know, they have to sing under pressure and they have to perform under pressure all the time. Without high notes, it's very difficult to be a tenor. Many people even don't care about the rest, they just want that note. And if that note doesn't come right, they could even boo you, even though the rest was beautiful. You need to have good nerves to be able to sustain a career made of pressure. One opera that really piles on the pressure for any tenor is Donizetti's comic masterpiece, La Fille du Regiment, the daughter of the regiment. If you don't have those high notes secure, you will be crazy to sing that opera. You will be really you know, committing psychological suicide. This aria, A Mes Amis, sung by the character Tonio, is known for its many high notes. A 
Amisa Mi is an aria that requires very bright, very shiny, very luminous high notes. Je vais marcher sous ma drapeau. Where do you put that note? You don't know. In a piano, you know where the notes are. In, in the voice, it's somewhere there. But there's a space for that high note where it comes shiny, loud, bright. And you have to put it in that position. And a little higher is wrong, a little lower is wrong, a little to the side is wrong. So there's a lot of control going on, but you have to sound and look like you're just having fun. <laughs> but let me tell you, it can't all be fun, because this part of the area has an incredible nine topsies. Tony is from Tirol. That music is a yodel. So it's supposed to be pur ma na It's his music from his country. Nowadays we have turned it into a pur ma no, laser beams, which people like. I don't think they will like any more. They would, come on, man, sing. That shows what amazing things the human voice can do. But to be able to sing with this power and control, we need to use more than just our vocal cords. All singing voices have different zones, and it is the job of the professional opera singer to make the transition from one zone to the other seamless, so that we keep the same color of voice from bottom to top. Let me demonstrate. In the tenor voice, there are three recognizable zones. The low zone. Ma there I am mostly using my chest resonance. The middle zone. I am using a combination of head resonance and chest resonance. And then we go to the famous passaggio. 200 years ago, tenors used to sing his high notes with falsetto. Today we use our full voice. We bring the chest voice and we help it with the resonance of the head voice. The passaggio is an Italian term used to describe the notes which act as a bridge between the chest voice and the head voice. Much of a tenor's training is to make this transition as smooth as possible. This famous aria by Donizetti presents a challenge for any tenor. It starts on an F, the beginning of the passaggio. And then it moves up, where I use my head resonance. Oh, 
the full-throated tenor voice, as we know it today, is a relatively modern phenomenon. Synonymous with the hero or the great lover, it didn't quite start that way. To trace the evolution of the tenor voice, we need to go back all the way to the 18th century. It's an interesting period for the tenor voice. In the opera, one has to say that the tenor voice is relatively unimportant. The tenor does have a role, but it's often a, a more subsidiary role. Often the baddie in the opera is actually the tenor, not the romantic lover, as one might expect in modern opera. Pastorello d'un povero armento pur dorme contento pur dorme contento sotto l'ombra d'un fatto d'alloro In this area by Handel you can hear that he has written music that sits quite low in the voice and the colors are darker than what we are used to. This was a typical use of the tenor in operas of the period. The heroic male singers of the time were castratos, men who had been castrated before puberty to preserve the purity of their high notes. These castrato singers had tremendous power. They were, in a sense, singing the tenor type of role one octave higher. And this is quite interesting. So these male voices had, you know, all the thrill of the high notes of a soprano, but the physique of a man. It was capable of singing very florid, virtuosic music. And of course, these singers were the great superstars of their day. Well, there are no castrati that we know of singing nowadays, but the closest we get to what they might have sounded like is when a man sings falsetto, known as a countertenor. Listen to the extraordinary voice of Christophe Dumont in this production of Handel's opera, Giulio Cesare. <laughs> But after Handel, composers such as Donizetti, Bellini and Rossini did begin to incorporate high notes for tenors in their operas. To tackle this, the tenors would use a falsetto voice. When was the modern tenor born? When was that moment when he started to use other parts of his body to sing the way we tenors sing today? Mm. Well, the origins of it are a little bit mysterious, but in the early 1830s, uh, you get um, Gilbert Louis Duprez, the great French tenor, coming to Italy, studying with Donizetti and so on, and he discovers that he can extend this chest sound much higher than was previously done. We mark it with his performance in 1837 of William Tell in Paris. The performance was a sensation, as the tenor Roberto Alagna explains. Gilbert Dupré invente le contrut de poitrine, en pleine voix. Et Gilbert Dupré va révolutionner complètement le chant. De, de, il va révolutionner, pas le chant, la voix de ténor, spécialement, à, grâce à cette, ces notes très puissantes, très mâles, très viriles. Le public va être en extase devant cette prouesse héroïque, j'ai envie de dire, et, et, et époustouflante, qui est d'émettre des sons d'une telle puissance à une telle hauteur. Obviously, there were no recordings at the time, but from this performance by Chris Merritt, you can get an idea of just how startling it must have been.
In 1837, nobody had heard a tenor ever sing like this before. But not everyone was convinced. Rossini hated it. <laughs> uh, he thought it was like a capon having its throat cut. But certainly after the late 1830s, once tenors had sung up there, there was no going back because it was such a sexy thing that they all had to do it. <laughs> enjoy I would say the greatest success there's a reason why when you go to restaurants nobody ever plays a soprano voice <laughs> they don't play lower voice either they play the tenor voice <laughs> Does repertoire play a role here? Does the, the music written for the tenor voice makes that voice stand out from the other voices? It certainly does. Um, tenors have the most fantastic tunes. I mean, 200 years ago, people would come to the opera, listen to the tunes, and have a cup of tea during the boring bits. And people would leave the opera house humming the tunes, whistling the tunes. And the tenors had all the best tunes because they had the best roles. So, tenors were now the heroes, but the roles on offer suited some voices better than others, and three main types of tenor voice emerged. The first is the lyric tenor. As the name suggests, it describes a clean, elegant and beautiful sound. This is the impeccable Fritz Wunderlich singing Mozart. Wunderlich was one of the great lyric tenors. And by that I mean that his voice had a charm, a sweetness, a masculinity that was completely natural and unforced. And he sang so beautifully and so well that there was no separation between the charm of the man and the charm of the singing. The personality was allied to the voice, nothing got in the way. A great Mozart tenor, or a great lyric tenor, if you like, will always have beauty of line. Imagine if you were to press all the toothpaste out of a toothpaste tube, and it just went on coming out, and it never stopped. Or you were icing a cake, and you pressed the icing thing down onto the cake. A singer must think of their voice like that, not like little chipolatas. And the greatest lyric singers have this flow of sound, and the notes are joined together in the most elegant and beautiful way. Aujourd'hui, on s'est spécialisé, encore une fois, dans ce genre de ténor, euh, qui sont euh, des catégories bien précises. C'est-à-dire que le public, le mélomane, a envie d'entendre dans tel ouvrage 
une certaine euh, couleur de voix, une certaine, un certain calibre de voix. Le ténor lyrique, c'est une catégorie qui brasse très très large dans le répertoire. The timeless story of Romeo and Juliet, as set here by the French composer Charles Gounod, is a lovely example of the lyric tenor's art. In the aria A Leve Toi Soleil, Romeo is waiting impatiently for the sun to rise, so that he can see his beloved again. L'air de Romeo à Lève Toi Soleil est un air d'une beauté incomparable. Parce que c'est une œuvre de jeunesse, c'est une œuvre euh, qui demande euh, la jeunesse du personnage. Donc c'est le premier amour de, de cet enfant qui a 16 ans et qui rencontre l'amour comme ça presque par hasard. Il est impatient, il est fougueux et en même temps ça reste un, un, presque un enfant, un adolescent. Et donc il faut le trouver, le juste équilibre dans cette voix qu'il ne doit pas être ni trop sombre, ni trop épaisse, ni trop euh, mature. Mais en même temps, euh, il faut qu'elle soit corsée, qu'il faut qu'elle soit pleine, il faut qu'elle soit maîtrisée. Des aigus très puissants, mais puissants dans la souplesse. Il faut qu'on qu sente le soleil monter dans la voix de Roméo. Voice is really, in a sense, like a horse. You have certain types of horse race, and you need certain horses for those races. A horse that is huge and has the strength and stamina to jump the puissance, well, that has a tenor equivalent, the dramatic tenor. <laughs> Franco Corelli is one of the 20th century's great dramatic tenors. As you can hear, his voice is big and powerful, a rich sound suited for Verdi's great hero, Manrico. <laughs> The part really calls for some steel in the voice, and it's traditional to refer to this category of tenor as a spinter. Now, the word spinter is just the Italian word for pushed. There is a power, an athleticism in the voice. <laughs> you sense the risk. You can't hide. It's not all done with smoke and mirrors. You've got to do it then and there. And the public are there to see whether or not you bring it off. And of course, if you do, it's just thrilling. The German equivalent of the dramatic tenor is the Helden or heroic tenor. During the 19th century, the size of the opera orchestra had been growing. Verdi's numbered around 60 players, but Wagner in his epic music dramas was using around 100. <laughs> These vast orchestral forces needed a new breed of tenor to ride this wave of sound.
But it wasn't just about volume. It was also a matter of sheer stamina. Wagner's Siegfried lasts for four and a half hours, and the tenor is on stage for most of it. It would be impossible to perform this or any of the roles we've seen without a rock-solid technique. And one extraordinary singer shines out for his immaculate skill, Luciano Pavarotti. And now the lion. We go on the stage every night with the same feeling. We are afraid. And if somebody tell you this, tell you who is not afraid, it means he's a liar. Luciano Pavarotti was a global sensation, and not without reason. His voice was a ray of sunlight, and he had an immaculate technique. Here we are, ready to go. When he performed, you could see his eyes looking inside of himself and exploring every part of his instrument that needed to be under control in order to sing perfectly. I've always said that Luciano was the example of the greatest technique of anyone I've ever known or heard. Um, and again, it was just completely natural. So, I mean, I don't, he may have worked like crazy to find it, but it gave the impression of being easy and natural. <laughs> I always say technique in singing is a very personal thing. It's what you make of your technique, it's what you make of, of the way you sing. And Pavarotti, well, understood very well how to sing with his, with his voice. He used a certain technique in the passaggio. He did the piano in a certain way. He, for example, breath on his vowel A. He opened it very much. Ah, it was a way of freeing himself. His voice was, ah, pure sun. Pavarotti's spellbinding stage presence was conveyed by the sheer communicative power of his voice. But these days, the pressures on a singer's ability to act are bigger than ever. We are under an almost cinematic scrutiny. Many operas even make it to the big screen today. There is a myth that pacing and expression is all done for you by the composer. I think this is to way underestimate the importance of the artist, the importance of the interpreter, uh, and the extraordinary range of expression available within what is notated on the page. It's a world of expression that is vivid, powerful, intense, and plunges profundities that the spoken word can't go near. The opera repertoire places huge demands on the tenor. He has to explore a vast range of human emotion and a myriad of roles, from jilted lovers to princes 
to angst-ridden poets, and everything in between. Opera was invented because the spoken word was inadequate. With that sung word comes a whole new form of theater. The singing voice is like the mask in ancient Greek theater. It's a, an additional level. For a tenor, one of the most interesting acting roles is in Bizet's opera Carmen, that of Don Jose. Here you have a respectable soldier who's bewitched by the sensual gypsy Carmen. The part of Don Jose is an emotional roller coaster and tests your acting skills to the limit. In this Royal Opera House production, he's played by my great colleague, Jonas Kaufmann. I always admire the French way of doing an opera. They were much more driven by expressing the emotions, the development of a character in different steps. So in Carmen, for instance, the Don José starts as a very smooth, handsome guy who feels quite secure. You can hear that in the duet with his girlfriend, Michaela, that he's this typical lyrical tenor with smooth phrases. And then, as soon as he gets really involved with Carmen, um, the emotions change, he's not calm anymore. You already hear a different tenor. He is a little bit stronger, a little bit heavier, shows emotions easier. Then you go to the third act where he's jealous and uh, the jealousy makes him really um, be even more aggressive. And then you have the final scene where he really, really sings the hell out of it. If a character has a development, it's much more interesting as an actor to interpret than one that starts, ends the same as, as it started. In Carmen, Bizet wrote an aria for Don Jose that highlights the acting skills a tenor needs to inhabit a character. Don Jose had been sent to prison because of his love for Carmen. On his release, the first thing he does is to find her and declare his love with this aria known as the Flower Song. When you look at this Flower Song from José, I think it is not typical for a man to um, describe so specifically his emotions. Tu m'en veux alors? Et tu regrettes d'avoir été en prison pour mes beaux yeux? For him, this relationship with Carmen is his first moment where he feels real passion. Ça m'est égal. Parce que tu m'aimes. And so that makes him start to tell about his emotions. Knowing this background, there is an enormous influence on how to interpret this aria. It makes it not easier because it means that you start very softly, that you have to first get used to that fact that you're actually talking to a woman about your emotions. And then he's growing and growing and then he starts to tell how he feels, how he felt when she gave him the flower, that the flower um, was with him all the time in prison, that every time he took it out and, and the smell of the flower made him crazy. He 
realizes that he really has to go for it and, and he tells her, I love you, which is extremely hard for him to say, I'm sure. So obviously what you have to avoid is to be too loud at the end because that's what Carmen squeezes out. That's all she wanted. opera there are so many emotions involved you tend to lose a little bit self-control which is good you have to because otherwise it's not credible if you only fake the whole thing you lose the interest for the audience To become a great tenor, you need a combination of everything we've seen. A voice, obviously, but with a good technique, acting skills, musicality, and never-ending hard work. <laughs> For me, the artist that possesses all these elements to the greatest degree is Placido Domingo. He has sung more roles than anybody else, and his artistry is unsurpassed. very much aware that you are working with a god. I mean, the stage presence is quite extraordinary. I remember one night forgetting to bring the orchestra in for an aria because I couldn't take my eyes off him. <laughs> <laughs> Placido Domingo has sung over 130 roles in almost three and a half thousand performances. From the Italian repertoire of Verdi and Puccini, to Mozart and Wagner. He breaks all the rules of typecasting tenors. When I started doing big mixed roles, people were telling me all the time, it's impossible, you can't do it, you're going to ruin your voice. It's absolutely wrong what you're doing. And thank God there was Placido who said, but you see, Domingo did it and, and he's still there and he's still singing and he's still good in, in good shape. What do you want? <laughs> It's hard to pick any one role from this great array that really shines for Domingo. However, there is no doubt that his portrayal as Otello in Verdi's opera is a highlight of this amazing career. I have to say something that it is amazing. Yes, perhaps Otello is one of the most difficult operas in the whole repertoire to sing. But I have to say that they were many occasions which I was so involved in the character, so involved in the acting that I forgot about the difficulty of the role singing. <laughs> Yeah. 
Many people have told me, many other singers have said, it's one of the most remarkable things about Placido, is that when you stand next to him, you don't think it's a very big voice. It doesn't sound much next to him, but he has what I call blade. The voice travels like an exocet, you know, like Halley's Comet. It goes into the auditorium, and that's a great gift, a great skill. In this scene, Iago has sown the first seeds of jealousy in Otello's heart. See how Domingo totally inhabits Otello's character. He is the most musical Otello you can imagine. He is a wonderful musician. I love working with him because the most precise musician as I am. And that makes life so easy. And the personification of Otello is really wonderful. Domingo's artistry is his innate ability to fuse the text, the music and the acting into a complete performance. This is what makes him great. Throughout his long career, Placido Domingo has taken on new roles and challenges every year. These days, he's an established conductor, he encourages young musicians, and is a champion of broadening the repertoire. It was a particular pleasure of mine to be able to collaborate with him on an album of Sarsuela music, Spanish folk opera. <laughs> Today we tenors sing not only for the few who can get to the opera house. This extraordinary music we are lucky enough to perform now reaches a far broader audience. We have added to our repertoire folk songs, popular hits, modern music. The tenor is now an established part of the entertainment world. But how did we get here? The wonderful Jose Carreras is a tenor with a legendary voice and a glittering career covering a vast breadth of the opera repertoire. When he recorded the musical West Side Story under the direction of its composer Leonard Bernstein in 1984, many people thought it was a bold move. But the recording was a mainstream success and it captured the public imagination. Almost like 
But it wasn't so unusual. It was just another step in a revolution that started at the beginning of the century in the earliest days of recording. And the tenor voice was to play a pivotal role. The walls of this part of Covent Garden are covered with the pictures of some of the most important opera singers of the past. One of the greatest tenors of all time, and certainly one of the loudest, is this man, Francesco Tamagno. Verdi knew him, and in fact Verdi wrote Otello for him. And we are about to listen to one of the first recordings ever made by an opera singer, 1903, and here it is, Tamagno's voice. This was probably not the darkest voice we have ever heard in this role. But his ringing sound was superb. And I'm sure that's what made this voice so loud, so present. How they must have marveled at hearing just the different styles of vocal. Because you've got to remember, you know, the, the amount of population that were going to, to see an opera in the opera house was probably, you know, 0.02% at the most. So just hearing those voices must have been like an alien experience. The earliest recordings were on wax cylinders, and it was this technology that was to transform the status of the operatic tenor. I have the impression that there were a lot of tenor recordings. Is there a reason why? The range of frequencies that these machines can capture um, sits, sits quite well in that area. Right. The, the harmonics, the overtones that give you that quality and the, and the emotion of the piece sit well within the, the boundaries that this can record. If you, for example, record a soprano, those things disappear above the, the range that this can cope with. And I suppose this obviously had an amazing effect on the celebrity of the opera singers that did record. Before this point, the only way that you could, you could make more money out of your work was to perform more. Mm. And there's a limited amount of number of times you can perform a week. The one tenor to really break out from the opera stage was undoubtedly the great Enrico Caruso whose fame spread thanks mainly to his numerous recordings which made him a household name and the first operatic superstar. Caruso recorded time and time again. By 1914, Caruso's royalties had added up to $1.8 million. Wow. Can I have a go? Certainly. These phonographs had a dual function. Not only did they play the music, but by swapping the horn, they could record it as well. And we should be ready to record you. Right. The technology was simple but revolutionary. All sound is vibration. The vibrations my voice makes in the air are converted through a needle which etches a groove onto a wax cylinder. The louder I sing, the wider the groove. The softer I sing, the thinner the groove. When played back, the original vibrations of my voice are reproduced. I'm overwhelmed. There is something kind of melancholic, something nostalgic in the voice. There is a dark sound in it. There is a special pathos in the music. Probably it's because suddenly it sounds like an old recording.
I can certainly recognize my voice there, and yet it's not the same sound that people hear when they hear me live. Therefore, we don't know exactly how Caruso sounded, but thanks to his recordings, we know the kind of passionate performer he was, his extraordinary musicality. We can hear that beautiful, gorgeous, dark sound. He must have been an amazing, amazing live performer. The gramophone was also a way of marketing a singer, and it's not by chance that Caruso was the first big recording star. You know, the tenor voice is dramatic, it's romantic, it's lush. It has everything that can turn people's heads with music. Caruso became the first real superstar of the recorded world. The fact is that those tenor arias and songs were probably closest to what we would call pop music now, the format, they were three or four minute songs, and I think that's how opera first crossed over to a more mainstream public. The great Caruso became the image of the modern tenor for everyone, strong, virile, and romantic. And his powerful voice upped the ante just as Gilbert Dupré had done almost a century before. However, it wasn't long before a much more powerful medium appeared on the horizon, the movies. And a young tenor was to continue what Caruso had started. He had the looks, he had the voice, and Hollywood had a hot new property, Mario Lanza. <laughs> Mario Lanza started training as a singer, but once signed by Hollywood, his operatic career was over. His movie debut, The Midnight Kiss, made a hit out of Verdi's Celeste Aida, and he became an overnight sensation. The illustrious conductor Maestro Toscanini called Mario Lanza the greatest voice of the 20th century. Some praise for a film star. But who better to play the undisputed legend of the opera world? The colorful life and times of the fabulous Caruso spring to life. Sparkling with the songs you've never forgotten. Spangled with the wit and brilliance of a wonderful era. The film The Great Caruso was another huge success for Lanza. Here was a great tenor playing another great tenor. And Lanza's portrayal cemented this ideal. More than that, he inspired the next generation of opera singers. Jose Carrera said, if I am an opera singer, it's thanks to Mario Lanza. But it wasn't only him. When you became a tenor, did you study other great tenors? I grow up with Mario Lanza. I mean, my, my inspiration came from the recordings of Caruso and the great Caruso, the film that he did. Because, I mean, the, when you hear it on the recordings and on the film, I, it was a, such a powerful and most incredible, beautiful voice. And I love his voice. Mario Lanza was the first classical music artist to sell over two million copies of a song a record none had achieved before. But it wasn't with an opera aria. It was a musical number, Be My Love. The operatic tenor had crossed over into popular entertainment. 
And these days, it's not unusual for a great tenor to be heard singing this sort of repertoire. Just feel my arms, the way you filled my dreams, the dreams that you I mean, a lot of people say that opera especially can't withstand the dilution of repertoire coming from films or shows, but these voices are great voices. There's no reason why they shouldn't sing the songs. That Probably they sing in the shower or the bath anyway. You know, why shouldn't they sing them on record and everybody enjoy it? When Placido Domingo, Luciano Pavarotti and Jose Carreras came together to form the three tenors, their album was a phenomenal success. A mixture of opera, Spanish and Italian song and favorites from the musicals. More than anything, it showed that a great tenor could sing to anyone, and it cemented the voice as part of mainstream popular culture. So what makes a great tenor? None of the artists we have seen would have achieved stardom without one extra ingredient, charisma, or as the Greeks define it, a gift from the gods. To have a gift and not share it with the world is not good for the world. Opera requires a combination of many aspects of human talent and that is why it's such a fulfilling art form. Ah. <laughs> <sighs>